Scripture today is Matthew 13, 18, 18 through 23. You then listen to the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word about the kingdom and doesn't understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is the one sown along the path. And the one sown on the rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but is short-lived. When pressure or persecution comes because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Now the one sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the worries of this age and the seduction of wealth choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. But the one sown on the good ground, this is the one who hears and understands the word, who does bear fruit and yields some 100, some 60, some 30 times what was sown. May the microphone, so I'm just going to stick here, okay? I'll just stay here. May the grace and mercy of God his peace be yours. And God, I pray that as you are watering the soil outside, Holy Spirit, that you will water, water the earth outside, that you will water the soul within us, that we might be refreshed, renewed, and transformed by your power. In Jesus' name, amen. Did you know that Jesus talked about you a long time ago? Did you know that? talked about me. Jesus talked about all of us. This morning we're going to look at the parable of the so sower. Sometimes it's called the parable of the soils. It's the final message in our 10 days of prayer. And you and I are in that parable. The theme of the 10 days of prayer was that we are called to continue the mission and ministry of Jesus. And his mission and ministry was to seek and save the lost. His ministry was to serve others, to meet their needs, to come alongside them, and then he would bid them to follow him. And so I just want to do a recap of the messages of this past few days in case you weren't able to follow all of them. And I'm kind of capsulating what each speaker said a little bit. So I'm saying maybe perhaps a different way than they said it. But I gave the first message on the persistent neighbor. And usually in that parable we talk about we need to be persistent and pray and pray and pray to get, basically beg God to uh, give us what we want. But in reality, when you study it in its context, ultimately Jesus summarized the fact that while the disciples were concerned how they could minister like Jesus did, he said that the Father was very willing to give the Holy Spirit to anyone who asks. And that was the keynote, the thread that we really need to keep in mind as we go through all these parables. That if we are going to apply these parables to our lives and our interactions with others, we need the Holy Spirit to guide us, to give us discernment, and to help us along the way. And so the first group of, of parables we talked about are, are in yellow here. The first one was the parable of the lost sheep. Now the lost sheep leaves the flock, wanders away, and it knows that it's lost and it needs to be found. And it's the Holy Spirit who guides us to the lost sheep who need to be found. Then there was the lost coin. The lost coin was lost inside the house. It doesn't know it's lost, but it needs to be found, and we need the Holy Spirit to help us find those who don't even know they're lost yet. Then we talked about the parable of the prodigal son. It's actually prodigal sons, and these are two boys, an older one and a younger one. The younger one was lost at home long before he was lost away from home. The older one was lost at home and maybe 
even lost in a more dire situation because he didn't recognize his need. And then we looked at the parable of the, of the prodigal son focusing on the father, the prodigal father, the extravagant father who loves extravagantly. And in that parable, we discovered that it re really reveals the heart of God for his wayward children. That without that love of God for wayward children, there's no reason for them to come to him. And then there was the wheat and the tares that talked about the fact that it, there are many who are lost in church and you can't tell the difference sometimes between those who are saved and those who are lost. And as Greg said, it's not our job to judge. It's our job to love. Maybe a little stronger on that one. It's not our job to judge. It's our job to, lo to love. Thank you. And so those parables are talking about people that we need to, to help get closer to God who are already part of his family. But then we went on and, and we looked at other parables that only the Holy Spirit can, can help us apply to our lives. And the first wasn't really a parable. It was a metaphor of salt and light. And we discovered that salt is there to, to make and attract people to God. And we are as light to, to take the darkness away. And only the Holy Spirit can really attract anyone to God. And only the Holy Spirit can really shed darkness from the heart. And then we looked at the parable of the t talents, that God gives us the abilities and skills we need to share his love and character with others, both within the church and outside. And the Holy Spirit empowers those talents to impress hearts for his kingdom. And then we looked at the parable of the Good Samaritan that tells us that we are to serve through compassion, the same compassion Jesus ministered to others. We can only do that through the Holy Spirit, transforming us through the fruit of the Spirit. And the second thing about that parable is that we're to, to show compassion even to those who we consider enemies or that others consider enemies or people we th think have no business and no hope of knowing God. And then last night, or then that we looked at the parable of the wedding banquet. And then parable of the wedding banquet, we learned that we are to call everyone to receive the gift of salvation. We are to call everyone to receive Christ's robe of righteousness that God places upon us through faith. And we are then to allow his spirit to transform us so that we become more like him. And in that process, we are called to go out into the highways and byways to invite people to enter God's kingdom. And another, let me put it another way. We are to invite people that when you first look at them, you wouldn't think they have a chance of accepting Jesus. Let that soak in a little bit. We are to invite people that we don't think has a chance of accepting Jesus. They don't belong. They're not good enough. They're not like us. That's what that parable was about. And then last night, we looked at the parable of the sower and the soils. And in that parable, we discovered that God wants a harvest of people for his kingdom. Barbara talked about the different soils, and I may say it a little differently today than she did, but it's the same points. She did a good job explaining the soils. But in that parable, we are called to allow God to transform our own hearts as we invite others to allow him to transform theirs. And so as we look at this parable, we're going to look at the parable of the sower and the, and the soils from a different perspective this morning. And this is going to tie everything together, I think. As we look at this parable, we need to recognize, as I said earlier, you and I, everyone is in this story, without exception. And we're in this parable two ways. John Corson, in his commentary on Matthew, made this statement. 
This parable has two applications. Primarily, it speaks of how we hear the word, and I would add how we apply the word. Secondarily, it gives understanding about how we share the word with others. For those of you who heard Victor speak on the prodigal father, he made the comment that while we see ourselves often as either a prodigal son who left home and came back, or the prodigal older brother who was at home and stayed away out of his father's presence. While we often see ourselves in those two ways at different times, we are called to be the father who welcomes people home. And that's true in this parable as as well. While we need to look at how it applies to the soil of our hearts, we need to recognize that he's at the same time calling us to be sower of the seed of the gospel of truth. He's calling all of us. So why is it so hard for us to share what we believe? Why is it so hard for us to share what we our relationship with Jesus with others. Well, I, I heard a sermon uh, a couple of years ago by a friend of mine, a colleague, who, and I couldn't find the publication. I haven't been able to get, get it from him. But he said, outlined some of the basic fears people have. The greatest fear we have is a fear of death. And I hope for the Christian that's not as true as it is for others because we have a hope, right? The second fear is a fear of rejection. So the greatest, second greatest fear we have is a fear of rejection. It's a wonder anybody shares their faith, at least from a human perspective. A third fear is being alone. If you're going to stand up for your faith, you may end up standing alone. Another fear is the fear of public speaking. Anybody here recognize it besides me? And another fear is the fear of being misunderstood. If you're going to witness to what Jesus has done for you or what you believe about God, all but the first fear are a possibility. And we need to admit that apart from God's spirit, we will not have the boldness we need to proclaim what a friend we have in Jesus. And so I want to look at the primary application of this passage briefly that Barbara covered last night, but we need to cover again. How we hear the word. How we hear the word. There are four types of soil in this parable. You can read the parable for yourselves later. And I've, I've labeled it differently. Instead of the heart, the soil of the pathway, I call it the hard heart. There is the heart. Now, the heart in the Bible means man's mind, man's feelings, and man's will. Those are all included. And so, as Jesus told this parable, he said, there are those who have hard hearts. Our, our hearts are hard Partly because, our hearts that are hard are are hard, partly because they've had a distorted picture of God given to them. They may have seen God as a God of of justice and God of holiness and a God of, of righteousness. And those things are true. But that's not all there is to say about God. And so they become fearful of him. There are those, I believe, who've rejected God because they believe it. Why could they believe in a loving God who burns people forever and ever and ever? It distorted their picture of God and their hearts became hard. Or sometimes our hearts became hard because of what other people have done to us, said about us, what, what they expect of us that we can't fulfill. And sometimes our hearts become hard because of what we do to ourselves, foolish mistakes we made sins we harbor in our, in our hearts. The real truth is, is that everyone born on this earth is born, believe it or not, when it comes to our relationship with God, we're born with a hard heart that needs to be softened. The second kind of soil is the shallow heart. Now, when I studied this, I, 
I gained some new insight. The shallow heart is portrayed as stony ground. I don't know about you, but I've seen pictures of, of farms in, in the Northeast with, with fences made up of rocks that have been taken from the, the ground that was going to be plowed. And I had this picture of, of a ground that's just filled with stones, and the stones have to be removed. That's not the kind of soil it's referring to. Because in that area of the world, the farmers in that area had soil that was relatively thin on top and a hard bedrock underneath so that the soil, the roots, could only go down so far and they couldn't penetrate the rock below. It would take hard work from the farmer to get that out of there. I think there's something also interesting about that. When you think about the soil being our intellect or our minds, what we believe, our emotions, how we express what we believe to God and to others, and our wills, whether we're willing to yield to God's spirit. If only your intellect goes into the soil, you will become imbalanced, and you won't be able to worship and express love to God as you should. And it'll be harder for your, your will to yield. If only you express your faith in God through your emotions, then you're going to feel good most of the time, but your faith will be weak because of what you do or don't believe. And it'll be harder to yield your will. And you cannot possibly yield your will unless you, yield, unless you are worshiping and praising God intellectually and emotionally as well. It is how we are made. Secondly, or thirdly, there is the crowded heart. That's the one that was growing up amongst the thorns. And the scripture's clear. I don't need to expound on it. It's the cares of the world. It's those things that come in that block our view of God. Some of them are even good things. But if anything takes first place of God in our lives, they are the thorns that we must weed out. I also found it interesting. I, I had something, a whole section planned on preparing the soil, and I'm going to talk about that in a moment. But I was going to say before he would plant, he would go out and cultivate. That's not how he did it back then. They would sow the seed, and then they would plow it and cultivate it underneath so that the seeds went down into the soil, and so the birds couldn't come along and get it. Now, and then there's the good soil, the soil that receives God's word. And I call it the soft soil. We all are broken people, and yet we all have a hard shell around us in some ways. We all have struggles. We all have um, thorns that we wrestle with with our lives. And they need to be cultivated. Our hearts need to be cultivated constantly. Let me put it another way. In different areas of our lives, we all have hard soil. In different areas of our lives, we all have shallow soil. In different areas of our lives, we all have a crowded heart. And in different areas of our lives, we all have a soft heart. And we need to ask God's Spirit to reveal to us what areas of our life do we need him to break the ground so his spirit can speak to us through his word. So that's the primary application. I would remind you of what Peter says in 2 Peter 1, verses 3 through 5. 2 through 5, 2, 4, I'm sorry. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God, in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. It is through the word we are given, we might become partakers of the divine nature. I would consider that a blasphemous statement if I were to make it by myself. The inspiration of the Holy Spirit makes that statement. It's another way of saying we become more like God. We're being transformed into his image. But there is a second 
application. And that's how we share God's love and how we share the word. The first thing we need to do if we're going to share the word, like the farmer, and this isn't in the story, but it had to be true, the farmer was intentional, intentional about sowing the seed. If you're going to share God's word with other people, if you're going to share God's love, you've got to be intentional about doing it. You can't just say, okay, I'm going to do it at this time, and I'm going to do it at that time. Every day, I need to pray, God, as I go through my day, who are the people you need me to touch? It may be by a word. It may be by a pat on the back. It may be by sharing what God has done for you. But we must become intentional about being sowers of God's love and God's seed in our daily walk through life. The farmer was intentional. He put the seed in the sack, walked out to the field to sow the seed. Now, there's something even about being intentional walking out to the field because as we look about it, we, we need wisdom and discernment in how we sow. And the farmer had wisdom and discernment. discernment. He knew where to plant. He didn't go off into an area with a lot of trees to sow the seed. He didn't go off into an area of marshy land to sow the seed. He went to a plot of land that he had previously worked when he first laid eyes on it, when it was filled with weeds and maybe even some small trees. He went out and he broke the soil, and it was laborious, and it was hard, and it was difficult, but he did it anyway because he knew in doing that he would end up with a crop. And so he goes to land that's already been plowed, already been cultivated, and he begins to sow. He knew when to plant. He knew, depending on the crop, when to plant. Just before the early rain, after the latter rain, he, he knew by watching the, the weather, whether it was going to rain and he should wait a while or not. He had discernment of when to plant. He also had discernment and knowledge of how to plant. I've already referred to that. He would sow it. And it's not like we can do today where we've got tractors and machines that can sow seed right up to the very edge. He had no choice but to scatter it wherever he was, trying to get it on the soil that was the, the good soil, but knowing he would hit some places along the pathway and knowing he would hit some places among the thorns and knowing he would hit some places that were, was shallow ground. But he did it anyway because he just might get a little bit of crops from that, and he wasn't willing to deprive the good soil from the seed that he would need to grow a crop. And he also knew what to plant. I've kind of referred to that already. He knew that he had to, to plant certain crops at certain times, for them to grow. May I suggest to you that we need to do the same? We need to ask God, where is it, God, that you want me to plant your word in people's lives? How, where is it that I can plant your love in the hearts of people? Where is it I can reveal that to them? We need to know when to plant. I heard someone at a funeral one day give a sermon to someone who, who was not an Adventist, about someone who died who was not an Adventist. And his sermon was on what happens when you die. They didn't need a sermon on doctrine at that point. They needed a sermon on hope. We need to know when to plant. We need to know how to plant. But by that I mean this doesn't require us to keep hitting people over the head with texts from the Bible. It doesn't require us to, to be able even to quote a passage of scripture at a certain time. It requires us to be so in tune with the spirit that we know when we, we should say something and when we, sh when we should shut our mouths. When we should just come alongside in love and when we need to open the word. There's something interesting about that. In Exodus 23 and in Leviticus 
there is a short section where it talked about the fact that every seven years, the farmers in Israel were to let the land lie fallow so it could be replenished and nurtured. I, I would suggest to you that sometimes when we present Bible truth to someone, whatever that truth is, sometimes we just need to say, okay, Lord, I'm going to let them soak that in for a while and you replenish and let me know when to open it up again. Does that make sense at all? And finally, how we plant. We need to plant compassionately. Not via argument. Not because I can prove I'm right and they're wrong. But I need to plant the seed of the gospel, the seed of truth, compassionately, with an understanding of where they've come from, what's driving them, what are, what are the needs they have. I want to end this message with a statement by Ellen White from Christ Object Lessons. She actually packages it all together very neatly. There is need of personal labor for the souls of the lost. In Christ-like sympathy, we should come close to men individually, men and women, and seek to awaken their interest in the great things of eternal life, salt and light. Their hearts may be as hard as the beaten highway, and apparently it may be a useless effort to present the Savior to them, but while logic may fail to move, an argument to be, be powerless to convince, the love of Christ revealed in personal ministry may soften the stony heart so that the seed of truth can take root. We as a congregation need to be committed to learning what it takes for each one of us to be able to share what Jesus has done for us. We need to learn how to come alongside people who need to know Jesus so that they can experience what it means to belong to his kingdom. As I was preparing this message, a song came to my mind. Not having anyone sing it, I just want you to listen to the words. The words will be on the screen. If you want to sing it, you can. But I want you to focus on the words because they encapsulate what we've been trying to say all week long.